complaints and eight years of conducting child forensic interviews. Uh, the terms victim and survivor will be used interchangeably. That is not to say that every victim identifies as or has the opportunity to be a survivor. Um, what we have here is going to be a short video clip. Um, it's, in, it's titled, What They Say About Working with a Criminal Justice System. And they are victims of sexual assault. This is their thoughts, opinions, feelings. Uh, kind of sets the stage for the necessary research and, and science that goes into this new type of uh, interviewing uh, that we're doing. So I'm going to just run that.
so you know obviously there's a lot of truths uh throughout that uh there's probably a lot of things that you can identify with things that you've heard uh in your experience of um either investigating uh sexual assaults or dealing with victims in other capacities of uh, the sexual assault um so this has been our history this has been our legacy however we can and are changing this culture uh, and it's done through educating one another through you know training one another and bringing awareness uh, to these issues and adopting best practices uh, based on science How victims, survivors may feel while being interviewed. Uh, victims of sexual assault can often uh, feel re-traumatized as they relive their sexual assault during their interview uh, with investigators. This is uh, often characterized as secondary victimization. While that is not the intent of the investigator, awareness and recognition of this issue by the investigator can lead to a more compassionate and informative interview uh, with the victim feeling safe, listened to and supported. And throughout this uh, training, you know, we're gonna see this again and again, as far as awareness and recognition, that is really just my intent, my purpose of bringing this uh, training about is uh, more awareness and recognition to some of these issues so that uh, we can uh, begin addressing them and changing them. What is a trauma-informed interview? Uh, trauma-informed interview recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in people and responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policy and practice while actively seeking to avoid re-traumatization of the victim. Importantly, a trauma-informed approach can be utilized in any setting. The goals of a trauma-informed interview are to reduce trauma to the victim while maximizing the information received from the interview. I wanna say that again, that's really important. The goals of a trauma-informed interview are to reduce trauma to the victim while maximizing the information received from the interview. I guarantee uh, people that adopt this, uh, this uh, setup, this format, um, and put it into practice, you will um, reduce the trauma to the, to the victim and you absolutely will receive better information uh, for the investigation for the case. Um, I've seen it over and over and over again. Um, and as we get into this, as you begin to see the, the research and the science behind all this, you absolutely uh, will begin to see um, how I'm able to say such a thing. Uh, often using a trauma-informed approach, showing empathy and believing a victim prevents secondary trauma. So some symptoms um, of trauma in people, um, you know, and, and again, I don't know necessarily what my uh, audience is here. It could be from no experience to a lot of experience, but we'll just go through some of these. Um, it includes difficulty beginning new tasks, blame, depression, inability to trust, especially those in power, that's gonna come up again, that's, that's a big thing, <clears throat> especially for law enforcement, okay? Inability to trust, especially those in power. Fear of risk taking, to, uh, disturbed sleep, eroded self-esteem, um, inability to concentrate, flashbacks, um, avoidance, substance abuse, uh, persistent expectation of danger, uh, they're always thinking or wondering what's around that next corner that um, potentially could harm them or hurt them. Uh, constricting, that's zoning out, memory impairment, uh, defensiveness, and hyperarousal. And these symptoms manifest themselves in our behaviors, uh, sometimes by now we're missing work or class where before uh, we had perfect attendance, um, inappropriate reactions reactions to conversations um, avoiding uh, tests blaming others um, arguing uh, where normally you know we're talking about a person that never gets involved in an argument um, those types of things are now coming about we are seeing those things um, 
I wanted to include this video and I want to give this warning that it, that it is disturbing. It brings up emotions for me to watch it uh, because it's an interview that's taken place uh, and it might be better characterized as an interrogation as it says at the top. We have a police officer in interviewing a victim of sexual assault, um, but the police officer is very uh, blaming um, and just the whole uh, tone and atmosphere uh, is, is not what we want to see. So I, I put it in here to kind of, as an example of, this is absolutely not what we want to be seeing in an interview uh, with a victim of uh, sexual assault. Like if it was someone that you had never known before and he grabbed you and took you into a house and started attacking you physically. How would you react differently? What would you do? I, I don't know. Like, I've never been in that situation. I don't know. What do you think you would do? I mean, uh, I could tell you what I would do, and I've never been in that situation. And you also got to get up and run out of the house, right? Yeah. I mean, he's taking your clothes off. How much of a fight did you put up for him? Not but I don't remember off? him taking my clothes off. How much did you resist him taking off your clothes? I didn't. That's the terrible part. You didn't resist him taking off your clothes? You didn't tell him no when this was going on? No? I didn't say anything. I was too scared. I'm still a little concerned with a lot of this stuff, though. And I think I need you to be a little more honest with me. Please. I am being honest. I didn't consent, but I didn't say no. So you just went along with it? I was scared. I didn't know what else to do. As you can see, absolutely inappropriate line of questioning, um, but I wanted to throw that in as an example of, you know, that's way off to the left, something that we want to be way far away from as far as uh, the atmosphere of the interview, uh, the line of questioning, just everything about it. We want it to be way over to the other side of things. Um, so to talk a little bit about what a trauma-informed interview is not, um, it's not just simply being nice. It's not just asking non-leading and open-ended questions. It's not focusing on the who, what, where, why, when, and how. Uh, it's not requiring a se sequential narrative from the victim right away. It's not expecting the victim to accurately remember peripheral details of the experience. Uh, and it's not requiring the victim to make a full and complete statement before they're ready or able. And it's not about maintaining control of the interview. Um, for the law enforcement people throughout some of these things, you're able to identify with them because you've been taught to uh, concentrate on certain areas here. Um, like the last one, maintaining control of the interview. That is in regards to a suspect interview. Okay, again, very different. Uh, so again, these things um, are not what is um, involved or what the trauma-informed interview is about. 
here, this is the, uh, the foundation of this format, okay? Through neuroscience research, uh, it has changed how we interview, how we want to conduct ourselves in the interview, the line of questioning with victims of traumatic events, whether it's sexual abuse, uh, whether it's domestic violence, um, we, this, this is the foundation. This is why things get changed up a little bit. Because now we know through the research and the science that stress hormones create reactions, okay? Behaviors and memory limitations that are surprising to most. In the brain, the hippocampus, which is responsible for storing episodic memory, episodic memory records these single events that happen to us personally uh, that we experience, not things that we uh, hear about, not things um, that we're told about. Um, it's things that we personally experience. Those things are recorded uh, by the episodic memory. The hippocampus is, is responsible for putting these, these experiences into chronological order and into perspective for us. Well, stress and fear impairs the hippocampus function. This is why after a stressful situation, people have trouble remembering some specific details and say things like, it was all a blur, or their recall of the events are fragmented. Neuroscience research has shown memory subjected to traumatic experience is fragmented and is not recalled in a linear or chronological way. Unfortunately, for an untrained first responder, these memory irregularities are chalked up as being deceptive, or at least will pull this person's credibility into question. What we learn is in regards to suspect interviews is if things don't go in a linear or chronological way, or if they leave something out, that suggests that the person's being deceptive. Well, those things kind of mirror one another, except in this case, it's for very different reasons. This person has been, uh, has, has experienced a traumatic event. While the symptoms will mirror one another, it's for very different reasons. And in this case, the type of questions need to change uh, so we're able to better elicit or get that information from the person that's been um, subjected to this traumatic event. Examples of common responses to trauma. If subjected to a traumatic, potentially life-altering event, most people believe they would fight back. However, some are so fear-stricken that tonic immobility, absolutely unable to move, or disassociation, the person focuses, focuses on something else, like something outside of a, a window, or they think of something in their head, in their mind, and they remember a better place, a better time, um, those things overtake them while they're experiencing this traumatic event. Uh, this is seen as counterintuitive behavior to most of us, but are in fact normal responses to stressful or traumatic events. Another example is asking a victim about the assailant's face when he or she was focused primarily on the weapon. Uh, this will further frustrate this person because peripheral details such as the assailant's face may not have received the same attention because the fear circuitry did not see it as a need for survival, okay? Also known as perceptual narrowing or tunnel vision. For anyone involved in a police shooting or sometimes uh, high-speed chases, your perception becomes narrower uh, and they call it tunnel vision. You lose per perspective of other things going on around you. Uh, details are encoded differently when faced uh, with a traumatic event and therefore in some cases need to be retrieved in a different way. That's very important. Details are encoded differently when faced with a traumatic event and therefore in some cases need to be retrieved in a different way. Different questions need to be asked or questions need to be asked in a different way. Uh, this is a video clip uh, titled One Moment Investigators Should Watch For. Um, it's by Dr. James Hopper. Uh, he's an instructor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School. Um, I'll start that up. So 
there's, so there's one moment in a sexual assault that is really important for investigators and prosecutors to listen for and to discover and to mine for evidence. There's many moments, but this is a really crucial one. And that's when the fear kicks in. When that person's brain realizes that they are under attack, that this person they thought they could trust is now someone who's going to use them in a sexual way. Someone who they thought was caring or a friend is now treating them as an object and exploiting them, harming them in this way. And when that happens, we know from decades of research that when the brain detects that, this fear circuitry, the brain detects that and the brain shifts. People often freeze and stop moving to see what's going on and to maybe think of how they can get out of the situation. It also starts to impair the parts of their brain that allow them to think clearly and to actually understand what's going on and make sense of it and remember that there's people in the next room that they can call it to help for, things like that. When the fear kicks in, it shifts the brain in such a way that these thinking and reasoning parts of the brain become impaired and even effectively shut down. And so now the person is acting based on reflexes and habits. And so you really want to know in any assault, when was that moment when the fear kicked in? When did they freeze? Because they realized something was wrong, something bad was happening. When was their brain starting to get impaired in certain ways that they weren't able to think clearly and figure out how to respond? And also, this has real huge implications for how memory works. Once fear kicks in, it affects a part of the brain called the hippocampus that is responsible for encoding and storing away memories. And at first, when the fear kicks in, the hippocampus kind of goes into a super encoding mode. And this is why people can often describe in great detail just those moments before that mask came off and he started coming at them and doing something, or just before he started tearing their clothes off or something like that. And just afterwards, they can describe that in great detail. So it's really important to know when did that fear really kick in because it changes the way the brain operates, it changes what they remember, and right around that time, things can be remembered very vividly, but then minutes later, the memories can become much more fragmentary. So then you have an realistic expectations about how people are going to act and what they're going to remember and in how much detail based on just knowing when did that fear really kick in for that person. So again, very important information for those uh, speaking with and interviewing uh, victims of sexual assault. So just to recap a little bit on what he was saying, you know, as we, as, as we're thinking about getting that information, the story from the person, um, we can kind of expect in a lot of situations to have the first part of the uh, story to make sense, to be chronological, to be linear. Uh, but then when they get to that point where, like, like the doctor said, the fear kicks in, things are going to be jumbled. Uh, they're going to be fragmented, uh, out of sorts. So they won't make sense. And then after, uh, we can kind of expect uh, after this event, to th have things be more chronological, more linear. Things will make more sense. So that's good information that he had there. Uh, what a trauma-informed interview should include. Uh, first and foremost, we want to demonstrate genuine empathy. We want this person to know that we care about them and we care about what happened to them. Acknowledge the trauma and pain involved in this incident. Spend time getting to know them, okay? Establishing this rapport. It's easy, it's easy to say, um, but it's actually, that ought to be in like neon lights or something right there. It's super important to establish a rapport, mature that rapport, somehow make a human connection with this person. Um, whether it's sharing uh, information about you both liking to cook, sharing information about recipes, uh, sharing information about if, if you both like mowing lawns or certain cars, something that you both like doing, make that connection, that human connection, spend time talking about it. We've already talked about the fact that people that have experienced this traumatic event have a hard time trusting people in authority. This is where you start establishing that trust, okay? And if you get that, if, if you obtain that, they're gonna be more likely to um, be able to give you more information because they're trusting you. It's gonna be more detailed, it's gonna make more sense. 
um, be careful not to say that you know how they feel, okay, or what, what they've experienced, unless you have personally experienced yourself. This will discredit you in, in their eyes. Ensure a safe and comfortable environment <clears throat> emotionally and physically. Is the interview space welcoming, inviting, and comfortable? Um, are there clear exits? Make sure uh, they know that they can bring someone for support if they'd like. And if they are going to be, be bringing someone for support, make sure you have the correct number of chairs already set up. Don't wait for them to arrive and then start pulling chairs out of different rooms. Okay, do this beforehand, have that set up. Um, if you have control over the environment where this interview is gonna be taking place, take the time to make the small changes, okay? The seating arrangement, make sure your chair is right across from theirs. Your chair is not behind your desk. You're not talking over your desk with them. You're on the same side of the desk. Uh, there is some space between you. Their chair is the closest to the doorway. Uh, your chair is the same height as theirs or lower, not higher. If you have a lot of plaques, trophies, things of that nature, accomplishments on your wall, take them all down or find a different room. Um, if you have a pair of handcuffs on your desk, put it in a drawer. Um, anything like that, uh, take it down, put it in a drawer. Um, if you're normally in uniform on the day that you're talking to them, make sure that uh, you're in, you know, shirt and tie or whatever. Um, if you have tie bars and make sure there's no handcuffs on your tie bars, make sure uh, there's not a gun on your tie bar. Um, if you're wearing a gun, uh, make sure it's somewhat concealed with your sport coat or a vest. Um, anything like that, uh, try to either put it away or conceal it. What you're doing here is trying to make the place look less, um, uh, less authoritative, less uh, control of uh, control. Um, basically, when this person experienced this traumatic event, their control and their authority over their own bodies was taken away from them. You want to try to give that back to them. And it starts with a very simple, small changes with the room in which you're going to be interviewing them in. Um, so take the time, make those small changes, um, and it will benefit the overall results. Um, make sure there's nothing between their chair and the door. Uh, and have a box of tissues there. Um, they have gone through a traumatic event. You're gonna be talking about it. They are gonna be reliving it in their heads. It's gonna be emotional. So have the box of tissues there. This is just a down and dirty uh, diagram of what my office looks like. Here's a door here, a chair. This is a window up here, table, two windows here chair and then a chair behind my desk. So I would have the person come in, I'd have them sit here. If they have a person uh, for support on either side of them, uh, and I would sit here. Again, my chair is the same level or lower, not higher as theirs, and we would have that conversation here. What a trauma-informed interview should include. We want to be encouraging and allowing the victim to ask questions. Let them know that you want them to ask questions. It's very important. If they don't understand something, you want them to stop you and to get clarification. If they need something repeated, you're gonna repeat it as much or as often as they need. Allowing some time and space for the victim to process their experience, okay? This is very important. As a law enforcement officer, be okay with silence. God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them accordingly and proportionately. Prepare yourself for this, okay? They will need time to think and, and play things out, play the events over and over in their minds before communicating their thoughts to you. We've already learned people that uh, have gone through a traumatic event, these, these uh, the details of the events are gonna be uh, jumbled up. They're not gonna be linear. 
They're not going to be chronological. It's going to be difficult for them to make some sense of it and then communicate it to you. So this is going to take some time. Um, I put this little clip in here um, to, partly because of some comic relief. Uh, it's a little clip from Central Intelligence. I don't know if you've all seen it. Uh, it's a pretty funny movie. Um, but it's also, more importantly to this training, an example of what not to do. Um, we have the female FBI agent. She is in uh, this person's house uh, in the movie. He's referred to as the Golden Jet. Um, and her, her form of questioning is just rapid fire. It's just one question after the other. Um, so we see this. Um, she leaves pretty much zero time for response on his part. And what you see is you see um, a lot of confusion, him trying to play catch up. Um, so I just wanted to put that in here. And again, also for a little uh, comic relief. Jimmy, can I help you? Hello. It's my house. Is something going on? Well, Mr. Joyner, your sleepover buddy, Robert Weirdick, a.k.a. Bob Stone, a.k.a. Bob Golden, a.k.a. Bob Jet, is wanted for murder and treason, and is presently in possession of highly classified state secrets, which he intends to sell to our enemies. What? And if he succeeds, it's going to spark a chain reaction of geopolitical events that most of our predictive models place somewhere between World War III and outright Armageddon. So, yeah, I guess you could say something is going on. Would you mind? Uh, Kramer's in the, in the fridge. What? No, I don't need it. What I do need is information. I need you to tell me everything and anything about your contact with Agent Stone. Agent Stone? Bob. Your friend Bob. Come on. Stay with me, please. Oh, I think there's a, a misunderstanding. No, no, no. He, he is not my friend. Then why did he list you as his emergency contact in all his personnel forms? What? Bob Stone has no siblings or parents or family of any kind. You are the only person he listed in his personal references. Oh, well, that, that's, that's crazy. I, I barely even know the guy. Then why was he sleeping on your couch? Because we went out and had drinks last night. Oh, so you went out drinking with your non-friend. Okay. All right, let's, you know, time out. I'm, I'm pressing the time out button, okay? You guys barged in my house. I pay my taxes. So you're not going to come here and treat me like I'm the enemy, okay? That's, that's the first thing. Now, if you want to get into facts, you want to talk about facts, this is Facebook's fault. Are you familiar with Facebook? Free surveillance. So, yeah, there we have it. You know, rapid fire, question after question. Uh, certainly not, you know, the tone or the atmosphere we want to be providing when uh, talking to a victim of uh, sexual assault. Um, we'll continue on here. What a trauma-informed interview should include. We want to provide the victim with as much control over and during the interview as possible. Now, I'm gonna take that a step further. We want to provide the victim with as much control over the investigation as possible. There are ways and, and there are opportunities to allow them to have that control. And again, this goes back to, you know, the, the fact that this event, this incident took all of that from them, their ability uh, to have a choice or, or to decide yes or no, all of those things were taken away from them by somebody else. Um, so, um, what we want to do is try to give that back to them. And there are many ways of doing that. Um, let them decide the date and time to meet with you. Come up with some options as far as um, where to conduct the interview and let them pick the location. Uh, they decide uh, when they want to break or whether to continue once the interview has started. Uh, and they decide on what they want to talk about during the interview. Ask the person if they're okay with you talking to a witness, okay? Once you've uh, obtained the interview and you've identified some other people that you wanna talk to to help corroborate things, talk about that with um, the person and devise a plan. Maybe they don't want you to talk with this person yet because maybe they want the opportunity to tell them uh, what happened to them first, okay? It's just small little things like that can go a long way. Uh, make sure they know the status of the investigation and what the next steps are. Uh, make sure that they are a part of this decision process. Um, again, as, as you're planning out 
what the next steps are that you want to take. Talk about those next steps with the person. They might have a legitimate reason why they don't want you to do something just then and now. Um, you might be able to do it later and it would be better for them and it has no effect on the overall investigation. Why not have that conversation and why not make that simple change? Uh, what a trauma-informed interview should include. It should focus on uh, sensory type sensory type questions uh, because they help trigger memory and recall. We utilize this a lot, especially when interviewing children. Um, sensory type questions serve as retool, retrieval tools. Um, you can hear a certain song on the radio and it can immediately transport you to your high school prom or your wedding, something to that effect. Uh, you might have had an experience like that. Um, also, uh, the sense of smell. Uh, maybe you smell your mother's cooking and it immediately takes you back to uh, some Thanksgiving that you had when you were a teenager. Um, or maybe you're at a stoplight and someone in front of you burns rubber and you get that smell and it immediately transports you to your last accident where you smelt that same smell. Um, these things are very, very powerful and simply asking about what they saw, what they heard, what did something taste like, uh, what did something feel like, what did it smell like, those are very powerful and will trigger memory and recall. Um, it, will help, it will help orient them in their story uh, and it will help provide more detail for you. Um, also important are emotional responses to you know, how did you feel when, you know, X, Y, Z happened um, or psychological effects? Um, how did that affect you? Um, those types of questions are very important and they more times than not will elicit a narrative. Uh, and that's what you want is a healthy narrative where the person starts where they want to start and they give you a nice paragraph or two paragraphs without you saying a word. Uh, it's very powerful, uh, especially as testimony. Um, just an example I'd like to throw in here, just how powerful uh, sensory type questions are. Um, I was at a basketball game for one of my boys and I needed to use the restroom. So I came down off the um, bleachers, started making my way to the, um, to the restrooms and I see this male walking towards me. Um, I don't really, um, you know, identify this male as anyone that I knew, um, but the male walks by me and I smell the male's cologne. I turn around and look at him and I immediately remember him. I had interviewed him a month or two ago in regards to uh, the Ayla Reynolds case. So again, sensory type questions are very important. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Other things that a trauma-informed interview should include, avoid asking why questions, okay? We've heard this before and it's because uh, it can be perceived as blaming. Um, and we saw that in the video uh, earlier where the police officer was very blaming. Um, there's no, in my opinion, there's no place for a why question when, in, when uh, interviewing a victim or survivor. More times than not, the why is learned by listening to the narrative. More times than not, you'll get it and you'll never have asked the question. And also the why is not always essential or necessary to prosecution. Um, ask the victim what they're able to remember about their experience. This is a good way to ask an open-ended question uh, that will elicit a healthy narrative. It avoids asking specific direct or close-ended questions that the person can't answer anyways, uh, causing them more frustration and trauma. Research has shown that when victims are initially allowed to provide an open-ended narrative, they feel heard in control and ultimately trust their interviewers. Uh, continuing on, some other things that should be um, involved or included in a trauma-informed interview, uh, interview is questions like, tell me more, help me understand, describe for me. What are you able to tell me about your experience? Those are great ways to, to start this whole conversation. Um, 
ask the interviewee how the experience affected them uh, physically and emotionally. Help me understand your thoughts when. The interviewer should inquire what, if anything, the interviewee cannot forget about their experience. We learned earlier about the fact that people that experience traumatic interviews could um, experience flashbacks. There might be something that plays over and over and over in their minds. Uh, that's a great way to ask that question. Ask the victim what the most difficult part of the uh, experience was for them. Sometimes it's necessary to ask difficult questions. Uh, explaining why a difficult questioning is, a question is going to be asked is very, very important. It prepares a person, it gets them ready to receive it. Again, minimizing trauma and re-victimizing the person. Uh, it also gives them the opportunity, again, to have a, a choice, to be able to make a choice. They might not want to have that question asked right then. Maybe you can save it for later on in the interview. Okay, again, it's giving them a choice. Uh, by understanding the need and importance of the question, that will translate to acceptance to the question being asked and will result in a more detailed answer, okay? Lastly, as far as what should be included, at the close of the interview, investigators should summarize what was learned. This helps reassure the victim he or she has been heard. Reassure the victim survivor and provide services, okay? Really connect them with services. Let them know that the case uh, and their well-being is very important to you. This is where victim advocates are essential. They engage in safety planning, along with rapport building and answering victims' questions. Uh, again, going back to the rapport thing, very important. Um, and the victim advocates do a terrific job at that. It's, it's a continuation um, of uh, this building rapport and just making this person more comfortable with the whole criminal justice system process. Um, I've seen victim advocates establish such strong rapport that it takes a person who is very uh, timid and reluctant and would not make a good uh, witness um, to someone very strong and empowered and able to uh, be a great witness for um, a grand jury or for a trial. Uh, so this is very important continued steps here to connect them with the victim advocates to have that continued uh, work and service uh, being done. The victim advocate identifies and develops a plan to avoid uh, triggering uh, re-victimization or traumatic relapse. Uh, like drug addiction and um, can address housing, counseling, and other services. It's another uh, video clip here with Dr. James Hopper. This is how to interact with victims in a way that helps them feel supported. There's two key ways it's really important for law enforcement to interact with someone. Crime or been sexually assaulted. And the way we understand this is that first we have to understand what it was like, how they were related to by the perpetrator. And two key elements are that the perpetrator treated them like an object. So they didn't treat them like a person whose feelings matter, um, who deserves to be treated with respect. They were an object that they were using for some sort of power and sexual trip they were going to do to this person. So they're treating them like an object. They're not really connected to them. And then they're dominating them, they're disempowering them there through force or threats or actual violence combined sometimes with drugs or alcohol. They are taking away the power of that victim and they are doing whatever they want to them, treating them in a way that is disconnected and disempowered. So it's so important for law enforcement for every step of the way in an investigation, in all their contact with the victim, to make sure that they are connecting with them as a human being, that the victim feels understood, they feel there's empathy person and that they are given power within the limits of the role that is being played. You can't give them absolute power in everything about the investigation, but where you can give them power, even about small things like whether they want a cup of coffee or a glass of water, whether they want to take a break now, whether they like, I need 
to ask you some questions about this. I can ask you them after or before we talk about this other thing. What would you like to do? Just by giving choices and options to people, you let them know that you understand it's difficult and that you want to give them authority over this process as much as possible. So the more you can do to give them power and to connect with them, you're counteracting the very dynamics of the assault. And if you don't do that, and if you don't actually, you have to make an active effort to do this. It's not just going to happen. You have to really keep this in mind and do it. Because if you don't, you're very likely to leave them feeling disconnected from you and like they don't have any power in the situation. And you're just taking information. You're just trying to extract evidence from them and they're just being treated as a bag of evidence. And so you really have to actively counter this dynamic of disempowerment and disconnection with everything that you can do. So just an example that I'll, I'll put that kind of reinforces what the doctor just said. Um, I had a victim of sexual assault come in. Um, this person had an advocate and a counselor with her. Um, and this person wanted um, to just learn about the process. What happens if I want to, um, if I want to give like a, a complaint of a sexual assault, if I've been sexually assaulted and I want to go forward with criminal charges, what happens? So normally there's, you know, two or three different avenues, scenarios that we can give them, walk them through, um, and try to give them as much detail and information as possible so that they're able to make an informed decision for themselves. Um, so I did that. It's probably about an hour long. And she leaves. Um, about a week later, um, I get a phone call and she wants to come in and she wants to give me her story. She wants to give me the interview. Tell me what happened to her. So she comes back and um, comes in with uh, the advocate and the counselor. And about four hours later, I get the interview. Um, she wants three um, uh, breaks within those four hours. And she gives me the information. Um, but she tells me she doesn't want to go forward with any criminal charges at this point in time. She leaves the office. About a month later, she comes back and she says she wants to go forward with the criminal charges. Um, and then at that point, I make a game plan based on what I know from our conversation, what I think the next steps would be nice uh, to do, the first things to do. And out of that, um, there are some options and we decide together on uh, where I should start. Uh, so that's just an example of some of the things the doctor was saying as far as providing options and trying to empower them. Um, so moving on, wrapping up this here, uh, when a person experiences a major trauma like sexual assault, their brain records it in a different uh, way than non-traumatic events. The prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for complex behaviors, often shuts down during trauma leaving less advanced portions of the brain to record the event. One of the biggest differences between trauma-informed interviewing and traditional interviews is the officer is not in control, the victim is in control. First, connect with genuine empathy, followed by asking simple, open-ended, and non-leading questions or brain-based cues. For example, what are you able to tell me about your experience? This allows the interviewee to decide where to begin and what they're able to share about their experience at that moment. Applying this strategy helps reduce anxiety and allows the interviewee to recall elements of their experience that were critical or central to them. As we all know, I just wanted to say it and emphasize it, is it takes a community to fight sexual assault Okay, uh, advocates, uh, law enforcement, medical, prosecution, it takes all of us. Um, this information that I have given you is based on my training and experience. Not all interviews are the same. Some victims will benefit from answering questions in a chronological way, even after experiencing a traumatic event. People are not the same and respond to trauma in different ways. Um, I've conducted many interviews over the years and have obtained a number of different trainings. And these are just uh, some of the ways, some of the things that uh, have worked best for me and today are considered 
best practices. So that's all I have, Maddie. I don't know if we've had questions come in or if we're just gonna open it up or. No, not so far. So I think everyone's been holding it for the discussion. So yeah, let's open it up. Just remember to click the uh, unmute button down at the bottom of your screen. Did you want to tell them about the recordings and when it will be available and how? Yes, I can. Um, someone from Rockland was asking me in the chat, uh, maybe other people have this question too, uh, about the, um, this is, so this has been recorded and it will be available on the Mikasa YouTube channel. Uh, that's the main uh, coalition to end sec against sexual assault. Um, and so it's available there. Uh, it will also be, I'll send it out to um, the, today's participants so you can share it with your staff and coworkers. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. I think you really laid out um, in a way that I haven't felt quite so clear about before the connection between um, just the fact that trauma-informed interviewing and all of these trauma-informed practices are not just about being nice and sort of, you know, we, sh we should all kind of on principle treat people with, you know, good manners and so forth, but it actually really helps you get to the information you need and helps us get to, you know, the outcomes that we're looking for. So thanks for making those connections so clear. Oh, you're very welcome. I was very uh, happy and glad to do it. Detective Bernal, did you have a question? No, I'm all set, Joel. Thank you. Yeah, I was just checking. Thanks. Well, thank you all. I know it's hard to pay attention uh, for a long period over Zoom. We're all kind of uh it's it's kind of a uniquely exhausting format so thank you for sticking with us and um i'll be sending out a quick survey after um just as soon as we're off here and um if you're able to fill it it's just a couple of minutes you can can be as brief or as wordy as you like um but if you have any thoughts or feedback or other ideas for uh for future future trainings and events love to hear it thank you so much So the question was asked if that uh, RCMP dude lost his job. Anybody know the answer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do not know the answer. Okay. Someone, someone well, better do some deep Googling and report yeah. back. Exactly. Ryan, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I got to get out of here. You're welcome. I'll share a side note for Ryan and his rapport building skills. Ryan is going to chuckle with this question, or this uh, statement, but Ryan and I are interviewing some gangbanger from New York City that gets arrested for uh, murder, and Ryan's asking him about his foliage peeping uh, stay in Maine and how, how much he enjoyed coming up and driving and looking at the foliage where this guy really could care less, but it was kind of comical to watch Ryan go through that process with him <laughs> during the interview. Good job on the rapport building, Ryan. Thank you. Yes, I remember that well. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, you try to identify with this person and what do I have in common with, you know, you, you said it and there's really no other way to describe it. A game banger from like New York and then here I am from uh, Central Maine just trying to make, uh, you know, any way possible of connecting with this person and, and understanding why he's up here to begin with. Um, but, uh, again, that, that was my effort in trying to connect with him on a human level. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. These techniques can also work with, you know, in other kinds of interviews. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, it sounds like that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, detective. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you both. It was so good. Thank you. Baby Max. I know. <laughs> Just see the curl. Uh, it's my favorite part of any Zoom is seeing Max. Uh, can't hear you. Cute. Can't hear you, Amy. <laughs>